Welcome to Mastara, and here's a question for everybody. What are you doing on the 21st of Flower Month? If you didn't answer attending the Derrick and Mast Ball, then you need to rethink your life's priorities. It's only the biggest holiday in all of Derrick, even if most people can't afford to attend the actual event. It's the one celebration where the normally reserved Derrickinians cut loose and show off their wealth in blatant displays of gaudiness. All the money raised by these events go to charity, and the amount is always substantial. And the arrival of the elite for the party is always a colorful affair. I'm Mr. Welch, and it's time to trip the light fantastic. To clarify, there's not just one mast ball in Derrickin. Any settlement of any particular size will host one. Sometimes they're officially held by the government or a guild, and other times hosting duty will fall to various merchants. Prices are decided in advance, and the cost is never small. The simplest of balls costs 500 daros to attend, while the one held at the merchant's guild hall in the capital is a staggering 5,000 daros per ticket. And that's just the cost to get in. The actual cost is typically several times that, creating the costume and all the accessories to go with it. Normally, the wealthy of Derrickin don't flaunt it. They prefer subtle ways of displaying their wealth rather than flashy clothes, weird methods of travel like magical items, or wearing far too much jewelry. The merchants hate gaudiness. It's a sign of bad taste. What they will do is show their wealth through their hirelings and servants. They will bring their entire retinue to a store to show off exactly how many people that they have in their employ. Carriages will be constructed of the finest rare woods, something that the average person might not instantly recognize, but the other power players will immediately notice. Derrickinians prefer to keep everything about them pragmatic, by spending money on getting the best version of the item money can buy. Instead of just getting their letters of credit printed with eggshell using a Roman font, they prefer one with raised lettering, an off-white pale nimbus, subtle coloring, and even a watermark. In Derrickin, all business is serious business. That tenant of Derrickin society does not apply to the one day of the year when the wealthiest can cut loose. The mass ball might be a huge charity event, but the politics behind it are complicated and cutthroat. Since it is a charity event, anyone can attend if they have the money and the connections. Invitations will be set out, and even the order on the list of names is something that the hosts will spend hours working on. The higher your name is on the list, the more important you are. The true power players will be in the first 10% of the names while the nouveau rich will sneak in at the bottom. Patrons will petition behind the scenes to get their artist or musician friends added. For up-and-coming adventurers and celebrities, just getting added to the list is a major career boost. Once the list is determined and the invitations are sent out, then the jockeying begins. The actual arranging of the details regarding costumes, carriages, and masks will be left to the underlings who will try to get the most eye-catching commissions created, like their jobs depended on it. Because for most of them it does. There are certain luxury industries that will spend an entire year just designing a single costume for the masked ball, often getting the order for the new design the day after the last ball. For the power players of Derrickin, price is no object, and will even go outside the nation's borders to find rare materials, though that is considered cheating by many. Not all the balls are as cutthroat as the one in the capital or the larger cities. The smaller the ball, the less it will take itself seriously, as the number of attendees will be fewer. The quiet town of Hendry's Ball will often be a get-together of local friends, while the wild port city of Athenos's Ball will often spill out into the streets and the local pubs. For the powerful, the goal is to get invited to the largest balls, only settling for smaller locations if they have no other choice. The size of the ball you can attend will reflect on your societal standings in the halls of the Derrick and Elite. For the host, the cost of the ball is often exorbitant. The price of putting on the masked ball in Derrick and City would bankrupt smaller companies. This expense comes completely out of the host's pocket. They're not reimbursed at all by the guests or any of the funds raised by the event. All the money that is donated to the ball is required to go to the various charities that were predetermined by law. If a host does not thoroughly entertain his guests, then it will impact his standing in society, and more than likely the host will never be asked to hold another ball. The larger events will be arranged by an entertainment planner that sets up social activities, and the competition for the contract between those kinds of companies is ferocious. The creation of the ball is tied to how much can be spent on it. Normally a party in Derrickin is a reserved affair, with some musicians quietly playing in the background, while the merchants talk shop and make new contracts. The masked ball is meant to be a spectacle, complete with dancing and all manners of drink and food. Illusionists and other magical types will be hired to thrill the audience and encourage even more donations. Games of chance will be set up, with the odds being very much in the house's favor to increase the charity money raised. It is a fundraiser after all. Everyone is planning to donate, but they want to tell a story about the party afterwards. Boring fundraisers make for tight wallets after all. Entertainers in Derrickin consider the masked ball the pinnacle of bookings. Bards will make themselves known to the host as soon as possible, as will other entertainers such as acrobats and dancers. The smaller balls will often just use local talent as they don't have the money or the time to attract big name acts. 
This also gives younger bards a chance to expand their popularity and repertoire before having to travel to new areas. The balls are an economic boon to the entertainment industry, even if it is just for one night. A performer that impresses in front of all the attendees will often find themselves booked for an entire year straight by the gracious elite there. The fashions of the ball, oddly enough, never set a trend unlike in other countries. The costumes on display are often worn just for that night, because reusing a costume is a good way to not get invited to future balls. In the smaller towns, the gowns and suits will be handmade by master tailors, extravagant but not over the top, and the larger balls, all bets are off. Many of the pieces will use magic in one way or another, from simple illusions to being created by glantry and artificers for a truly unique condition. That method is frowned upon heavily by the old money elite is unfair. But if you want to turn heads, a gown made of blowing snow constantly circling your body will certainly do the trick. Those kinds of commissions are quite rare because of the cost involved, and most guests prefer much more mundane types of garments. Expensive as hell, but still mundane in the making. One trick to raise the prestige of a ball, especially the smaller ones, is to invite someone important outside of Derek to attend. This might seem counterproductive since everyone is supposed to attend in disguise, but invitation lists are almost always leaked in advance. People trying to figure out who the guest of honor is is considered a game. Heads of state are usually not invited. The security risk involved is too great. But lesser nobles like dukes are often sent invitations, as well as powerful adventurers and on rare occasions intelligent magical creatures. The masked ball in Anselmont had a guest of honor that was a sphinx from Serene, and that is still talked about decades later. The arch fay of the good kingdom love attending the balls, often without asking. There's a standing invitation for Oberon and Titania at the Derrickin masked ball, and they are frequently visitors for their own amusements. Inviting creatures like this are risky. Centaurs aren't known for being toilet trained. And then there was the time the king and the queen of the Shi showed up dressed up like simple servants, and that nearly ended in magical disaster. Bregbethel, the Green Knight, might be the life of the party, standing ten feet tall with green skin. But he's also known for betting on whether he could knock out a dragon in one punch. You have to weigh the benefits with the possibility your guests are going to burn down several city blocks before the night is up. When the big night comes, it's a spectacle for the entire city. The smaller cities treat the night as a holiday, with smaller unofficial parties held for regular people. But for the larger cities, especially the Grand Mast Ball held in the capital, people will line the streets just to see who is arriving and how. Elaborate carriages proceed down the streets to the guild hall, and on rare occasions they might be pulled by exotic creatures instead of horses. Once the draconic Earl Respin Octarchus arrived in his draconic form before shape-changing into his human form right on the steps and walking in. This caused quite a bit of alarm for the spectators, but the entire scene was planned well in advance to keep the town guard from opening fire. The mayor of Serene even attended once, landing at the steps in a Magitek flying machine for the crowds to marvel at. Security at these events is tight as you can expect. There is a large number of very rich people in attendance, many of whom have very powerful enemies. Add in the fact that this is a charity event where lots of money are being raised and you've got a huge target for thieves and assassins. The fact that Derrickin uses paper money instead of gold for large transactions only increases the lure. In order to make security as high as possible without having obvious armed guards everywhere, powerful adventurers are hired to attend to staff or disguise themselves as guests. Guards are put into costumes matching the theme of the year's event and armed with inconspicuous weapons. The guests are known in advance by the hosts, and the nature of their arrival is choreographed by the event planner. If somebody appears at the gala and it is known that they have not arrived, they will be taken into custody. The party itself is a well-organized affair. At the smaller balls, there will be food tables laid out and musicians playing songs for the guests to dance to using the latest and most in vogue dances. The larger balls lay on the spectacle, with multiple performers working the crowd, magical effects overhead, and a constant display of new foods and drinks brought out every hour. Guests can gamble for unique prizes, and auctions for rare or fashionable goods are both held in silent and open formats. The party lasts about five to six hours before the traditional midnight unmasking, after which all guests leave, though a few have to be helped out due to overindulgence. The biggest draw of the party is the mingling. By tradition, guests are not allowed to unmask or reveal their identity until the very end. But in reality, many of the more powerful know full well who each other are, even in disguise. For the more exotic guests, it's almost impossible to disguise their identity unless they deliberately underplay it. When Crethileth, the she-queen of beauty and lust, decides to crash a ball and her dress is comprised entirely of rose petals, it's hard not to recognize her. An avatar of Nob Nar, the hen patron of adventure, famously ate an entire ton of food at the ball and the hen meat on a dare. But these kinds of incidents are rare at the smaller balls and frowned on in the larger ones because inviting deity-level guests to a party designed to raise charity for orphans 
always runs the risks of the Immortal or Archfey, turning a guest that annoys them into a solid gold statue, and then donating the statue to charity. If you don't already have 20 adventure hooks in your head on what to do with this topic, then I have failed as a commentator. You've got lots of rich people in disguise giving ridiculous amounts of money to charity at a set time and place. The rogues and the thieves in the party should already be salivating. The paladins have already gone over the plans for the events and have identified no less than 17 security exploits, 12 of which were present the last time the event was held. Whether the players want to rob, protect, or just sneak into the place, this topic writes its own adventures. Next week, I'm going into depth on a rather hefty topic, the partisan organizations of Glantry. Doesn't matter if it's Fairy, Elf, or the BLO, or several other groups with a serious love of acronyms, the non-wizards of Glantry are pissed, and they're going to do something about it. But until next week, remember, in the words of Angus the Younger, immortal patron of the 4-4, I'm upper, upper class high society. God's gift to ballroom notoriety. And I always fill my ballroom. The event is never small. The social pages say, I've got the biggest balls of all.